And I believe at this point all the teaching about Holy Spirit is beginning to click. All the times that he walked and talked with Jesus, and Jesus said, come here, boys, let me tell you all about another comforter. All of that was beginning to click with Peter. He was like, man, that's what Jesus was talking about. Lord God, you know all my ways, you know all about me, but still you came for me. Lord God, you know all of my thoughts, you know all of my sins. Well, howdy and welcome to New Life. I'm Terry Knight, the pastor here in New Life Community church and I thank you so much for turning us on tuning us in I trust as always that the Lord's going to bless you up one side and down the others we fellowship together here for the next several moments we begin a series a couple of weeks ago that deals with the issue of Holy Spirit some things about Holy Spirit and we're looking into Acts chapter 10 there are two characters there are two primary characters one named Cornelius and then Peter the Apostle Peter that we all know and love And they had a vision. And I've been talking to you about that vision and the way Holy Spirit factored into that toward the end of some practical application in our own lives with regards to Holy Spirit infilling, Holy Spirit empowering, and Holy Spirit leading us in our everyday walking around life. Again, our text passage is taken out of Acts chapter 10, but tonight as we open, and we're going to try to get right into things, I want to take you to Acts chapter 2. We'll get into that in the teaching here very shortly, but I want to take you there with me now. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. I want to read uh, about three selected verses, beginning with verse 14, and the record puts it this way. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Verse 16, This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Well, you notice he said this is what was spoken by the prophet. It's coming to fruition, coming to fulfillment right then and there. And it has some tremendous ramifications for those of us that claim the name of Christ even in this day and age. I trust that you'll listen and learn and be drawn closer to Christ and assimilate these truths into your own life. It'll make a huge difference. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for everyone that's turned on the telecast tonight. And I pray in the power of the Spirit that you would speak to our hearts by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, you hang on. I'm going to be back here in just a little while to wrap things up. Keep your Bibles, Andy. Follow along with us, and I trust you're going to be blessed. Chapter 2, by the time of and through Acts chapter 2, it was clearly established that the Holy Spirit would be a central force in the work to be undertaken by the New Testament Believers, look very closely at Acts chapter 2, verse 4. First part of verse 4 says this. All of them were filled with Holy Spirit. How many of them, church? All of them, all the people from Pentecost were filled with Holy Spirit. Paul, in writing to the church at Ephesus, makes it very clear in chapter 5 and verse 18 that all of us, From that time to this time and beyond this time, all of us are to be filled with Holy Spirit. Whoever you are, God has purpose for you to be filled with Holy Spirit. So in an attempt to help us understand some things about Holy Spirit, I've taken you to Acts chapter 10, and the Lord willing, next week we're going to uh, dip into chapter 11 just a little bit. But here we uh, were discovering some very significant, a couple of very significant stories. A couple of stories that, though separated by approximately 30 miles of geography, certainly they're intertwined by the one Holy Spirit. Now listen, does it mess with your head a little bit to know that Holy Spirit's here with us right now? He's also with the church down the road that is lending credence to him. He's aware of that. And even clean on the other side of the world, same Holy Spirit. How cool is that? You can't do that. You can't be here and there and everywhere at the same time. 
but he can. He was with Cornelius. He was with Peter. Two different towns, two places, two different times. But Holy Spirit was with them all along. Fill in number one with me on your notes, if you would, please. By looking at the details of these stories, I believe that we can discover some practical insight regarding Holy Spirit's work in our own lives. That is, as it applies to our own stories. There's a reason why God captured these stories and placed them in His Word, what we know as the Bible, and we can read through them today. They're, they're hints, beloved, teachings about how God wants to interact in our own life. First thing, and I'm headed back to uh, maybe part one, part two, but first there was a story of a Roman soldier. He was tasked with or given the responsibility of or given an authority over 100 subordinate soldiers. He was an Italian fella named Cornelius. Call him a centurion because he was over 100 a century of men. Cornelius was a Gentile. It's very important that you know that. In fact, you may want to put that on your notes somewhere or another. Cornelius was a Gentile. What does that mean? That means simply he was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. But the record is very clear that though he was a Gentile, he was a devout seeker of God. Very devout seeker or follower of God as much as he knew. I want you to catch that. He was following God very devoutly as much as he knew. Well, this Cornelius received a vision from a messenger of God. And as far as I'm able to tell, Cornelius had not yet been born again, as far as I can tell. Nor had he been spirit-filled yet. That too is an interesting detail. This angel speaks forth to Cornelius from within the vision and he instructs Cornelius to do something that would merit an act of faith on his part. Fill in number two with me if you would please. Beloved, God had a message and God had a mission for Cornelius. But he didn't, didn't fully disclose that directly to Cornelius, not just yet. Cornelius had a vision, but it was just kind of partial in its contents. God had a message for him, had a miss, mission for him, but he didn't lay all that out for him just yet. Now, I said that to get to number two on your notes. Beloved, God is usually very strategic with His message and His mission for an individual. God is usually typically very strategic with His message and mission. Keep that in the back of your mind, if you would, please. The vision mandated for Cornelius was to fetch this pretty well-known Bible character, Simon, whom Jesus nicknamed Peter. It's important to note that Cornelius had no idea what was transpiring on the other end of this vision. The second story that we're looking at, we'll get to it very shortly. I said to you last week that when God influences you, when God influences you, can you say me? When God influences you by Holy Spirit, you can rest assured that the outcome will involve at least two things. It will involve faith on your part. It will also involve other people. Other people beside yourself. How many of you know that you're important to God? You know that? But did you know it's not all about you? You're important to God, but it isn't all about you, the fella or the lady sitting beside you is just equally as, as important to God. We're all important to God. And it's very important that we see ourselves in or within that context. Well, Cornelius was about to discover that he was going to need some faith and other people were going to be involved in his life. He's about to discover that in a very dramatic way. It's directed in the vision, and you can find that around verse 5 and 6 of chapter 10, Cornelius faithfully instructed two of his men, apparently some servants or something to that effect, and then one soldier he instructed to travel some 30 miles down to Joppa to fetch Peter, whom he did not know. So, that brings us to our second story. Meanwhile, somewhere on the outskirts of the seaside city, 
of Joppa, we find Simon Peter in an eerily similar situation as Cornelius. Look at verse 9 of Acts chapter 10. About noon the following day, Cornelius received his vision 3 o'clock the previous day. About noon the next day, as they, as Cornelius' ambassadors, were approaching the city, the city of Joppa, Peter went up on the roof, this flat deck-like roof, to pray. Why did Peter go up on that roof? He went up there to pray. Now, during that season of prayer, Peter, like Cornelius, encounters a vision from God. Now, Peter's vision, though very different from Cornelius' vision in terms of the content, it was directly connected to the vision of Cornelius. I want to suggest to you that Peter's vision would ultimately serve to fill in the blanks left by Cornelius' vision. Cornelius' vision left him wondering about some things, and we're going to find out Peter's vision did the same, but they're going to come together here very shortly. Uh, look at number three on your study notes and fill this in with me. Beloved, in addition to Peter's vision, in addition to Peter's vision, which was very graphic, we talked about it a little bit last week, we'll just hint about it today, I'm going to go into some detail about it next week, the Lord willing, but in addition to the vision, Peter encountered another what I'm going to call an episode. Can you look at your neighbor and say episode? He encountered another episode. Maybe you've had some episodes this week. Now I want to say to you that the episode that Peter encountered, this additional episode, uh, very frankly, would have been very routine for him. Very routine for him. Here's a little mini parentheses. parentheses. Stick with me. Look at verse 19 of Acts chapter 10. It says, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, pondering the vision, hmm, what did that mean? Man, that was a weird vision. And it caused him to rethink some things that he had been taught all his life. So while he's still thinking about the vision, it says, the Spirit said to him. Now I want to remind you, this is the very same Peter that we read about in Acts Chapter 2, many chapters earlier, the same Peter that God used to explain to the world that which was going on about the most unique uh, day of Pentecost, or Pentecost feast, if you please, in the history of mankind. Now look at Acts 2, verse 14. We talked about uh, some of this a little earlier, but look at this. I thought I had verse 4 in there for a moment, and I don't. It's verse 14. Here's what it says. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, the apostles. Stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. And here's what he said in verse 16 of that same chapter. This is what is going on here right now. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. If you have a Bible this morning, you have the prophet Joel in your hands. It was given long before this particular instance in Acts chapter 2. But Peter knew about prophet, the prophet Joel. He knew about the writing. His uh, folks had taught him about that. He probably went through some form of catechism and quoted these things. Oh, he knew all about that. But he probably read over it many times like some of you may have and scratched his head and thought, what in the world? But here he's beginning to get it. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Look at verse 17. In the the last days. Pastor, is he talking about something that's yet to come? You're way out there in 2050, 2075, 20 whatever. Is that what he's talking about when he says last days? Will you notice again that emboldened word? He says this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. What was taking place then is what was prophesied. He wasn't talking about something out in the future at that point. He's saying, hey guys, here it is. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my what? On people. And if you go over and read verse 38 of chapter 2, it'll say something about it. And in fact, Peter ended the sermon that day with these words, You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Peter, who had the vision, 
in Acts chapter 10 is one and the same with Peter in Acts chapter 2 who had had all kind of interaction and a history, although a recent history, with Holy Spirit. Now listen, beloved, if you purpose to go back and peruse the record from chapter 2 on through to verse 10 and even beyond that which we'll get to, I trust, but if you do that, you will no doubt be struck by the number of times that Peter, Simon Peter, begins to boldly and confidently speak about Holy Spirit influence in his life. You will recall that before Pentecost, Peter swore to God that he didn't know who Jesus was. You remember that? Same guy. Hey, hey, you're with Jesus, aren't you? No, I don't know that guy. I swear to God, I don't know who that guy is. Old coward, Peter. But you know what? From this point on, and I'm going to have you fill in number four with me on your notes. After Pentecost, and after Holy Spirit is given to all of them, there is no such point where Peter is tenuous, which is a kind of a fancy word for reserved or hesitant about Holy Spirit. Why is that? Why is it that he, he was so tenuous and, and so cowardly about his relationship with Jesus prior to Pentecost, but after Pentecost and that experience, why is it that he's emboldened all of a sudden? I'll tell you why. I believe it's because Holy Spirit was working inside Peter from Pentecost on to, uh, to, to really to bring to remembrance all the prerequisite references about Holy Spirit. Look again at verse 19 of chapter 10. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Holy Spirit begins to speak to him. And I believe at this point all the teaching about Holy Spirit is beginning to click. All the times that he walked and talked with Jesus, and Jesus said, come here, boys, let me tell you all about another comforter. All of that was beginning to click with Peter. He was like, man, that's what Jesus was talking about. Are you with me? By the way, this is some good preaching, in case you were wondering, okay? How many of you know that usually when you get it, you get it? Are you with me? When you get it, you get it. Do you guys know a lot of people in the, in the spiritual realm, they're kind of, and I don't really mean to make fun, but this is kind of, well, I guess I am, but uh, it'll kind of help you. They're just kind of like, do, 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 do. What do you know about God? Oh, I believe in God. Do, 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 the big man up in the sky. What do you know about Jesus? Oh, I believe in Jesus. He's a little bitty baby that come at Christmas. What do you know about Holy Spirit? Oh, Holy Spirit, I know about them people. My grandma had the Holy Ghost. I don't want none of that. Do, 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 do. But when you get it, when it clicks, you usually... Get it. What do you mean by that, Pastor Terry? Just to be as plain as I can, beloved, when something transpires in your life that is genuine and factual, you are typically aware of it and prone to speak out about it. Isn't that true? Especially if it's something good. You ever read in the paper where Joe Blow won the lotto $300 million, but Joe has decided to stay home and not tell anyone. Maybe not his family, but he wants everybody else to know. And a lot of old people are pretty quick to let you know about that sort of thing. Listen, beloved, Peter was getting it that he got it. He was getting it that he got Holy Spirit, and he was gabbing it. He was telling it. It was beginning to click. Hang on to that thought. As Cornelius was instructed to fetch Peter, Peter on the other end was likewise instructed to cooperate with these fellers who were coming to fetch him. Look at verse 19 again. First part we've looked at several. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, here's what the Spirit said, Simon, three men are looking for you. Isn't it interesting that the Spirit called him by his given name, not his nickname? Simon, 
There are men looking for you, so get up, go downstairs, get off the roof, usually little stairs that were down the outside of the, the house, go downstairs, do not hesitate to go with them. Check this out, for I have sent them. Holy Spirit says don't hesitate to go with these guys. There's some guys about to knock on your door. Don't hesitate to go with them because I sent them. Peter knew that voice. He was used to that. He knew what he needed to do. Now, here's a little something from part two that I need to repeat to you because I think it's very important. There's a little parenthesis right here. Don't get lost. I want to remind you again that neither Cornelius nor Peter prayed and asked for a vision to come upon them that's not what they were doing and there's no biblical indication whatsoever that you and I should pray and ask for a vision however having said that beloved if God deems you worthy of such vision there's more than a possibility that one could come upon you even in this day and age and I believe that both Cornelius and Peter exemplified the pattern for the New Testament saints for you and I they were not pleading for a vision but both of them were clearly seeking God both of them clearly seeking God period and that's what we should be doing in this day and age in particular in this day and age is seeking God that's story one story two let me see if we can pick up with where these two stories collide I want to pick up at the point with the arrival of Peter in Caesarea they've walked a long ways 30 some miles Verse 21 of Acts 10 says, Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? Why have you come? Again, I want you to understand that it had not been revealed to Peter yet just what this was all about. They explained that Cornelius sent them to fetch him for the reason that, to fill in number five with, you, with me on your notes, Cornelius wanted to hear what Peter had to say that's interesting you see Cornelius was kind of left hanging with his vision go fetch this guy Peter but he wasn't told why I'm sure he's wondering what is Peter going to bring me what is Peter going to say to me keep in mind this is a guy that devoutly sought after God how interesting is this wouldn't you love to hear some stories like this today wouldn't you love to see a headline like this today in the Post-Herald, editor Boojum Snark, a headline that says something like, Holy Spirit is influencing spiritually curious seekers to pursue the Spirit-filled man of God in order to see what they have to say. Wouldn't it be awesome to see a headline like that today? Wouldn't it be incredible to hear somebody from New Life Community Church having a conversation like that? Man, I'm interested to find out. I'm curious about. I'm seeking to find out what the Spirit-filled man of God has to say. Well, that's what was happening with Cornelius. Now, the next day, I knew we'd get there sooner or later. But the next day, Peter gathered six other brothers from Joppa, according to chapter 11. And they all followed the three, these three ambassadors that were dispatched by Cornelius. They all followed them back to that fair city of Caesarea. Apparently, Cornelius was more than excited about that which the man of God was going to bring to him. How do I know that? Look at verse 24 of Acts chapter 10. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was, read it with me church, expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends you hear me new life man what a timely passage for super sunday hmm? cornelius was expecting them i said to the worship team in our Well, beloved, we're going to wrap it up right there tonight. And let me do so by reemphasizing something that we said here just moments ago. And that is that Cornelius, neither Cornelius nor Peter, were seeking a vision from God. They weren't seeking something spectacular from God. They were simply seeking God. And the vision was part of God's plan for their life. 
emphasis is they were seeking God. Hey, can I ask you tonight, or, or whenever you may be listening to this particular teaching, are you seeking God or chasing after some particular element of God's plan that you've observed in someone else's life? I want to be an encouragement to you just to stop right where you are and say, you know what? God has something for me because He does. And I'm going to seek Him to find out what that special something is for me. And whatever it is, it's going to be reflected in the Bible, the Word of God. I can assure you of that. But God does have a plan and a purpose for your life. And if you seek after Him uh, and begin to understand how to listen to Holy Spirit and live in obedience to Holy Spirit's work in your life, you'll begin to see God's plan come into fruition in your life. Watch this. Sometimes it happens... And we don't even realize it until after the fact. And we look back and we realize, you know, God was speaking to me. I, I submitted to, I yielded to, I obeyed that still small voice. Some things worked out incredibly well in my life. And I realized that God's hand was upon me. Now there's another level of spiritual maturity where we begin to hear from Holy Spirit and we purposefully, willingly live out an obedient lifestyle. And it kind of looks like this. Lord... What do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to go? Lord, provide divine appointments and fill my mouth, fill my spirit with your spirit and enable me to make contact with others toward the end of uh, doing your work in their life or sharing your work in their life, the gospel message, the good news about Jesus Christ. Are you living your life that way? You can. Perhaps you haven't been living that way, and I may be even speaking to uh, people who are involved in a marginal way. You're involved in church activities, but you haven't been living your life that way. Good news is you can start right now. Right now. It sounds cliche, but today is the first day of the rest of your life. And I want to encourage you to seek God. Lord, what do you want me to do today within the realm of your plan and your purpose for my life. Start that today and watch what a tremendous difference it makes in your life as an individual and in the lives of your family. It'll begin to make a huge difference in the church life that you are the uh, congregation, the body that you're connected with, and it'll begin to make a huge difference in the community. It will. Well, I'm Terry Knight, the pastor of New Life Community Church. I'm going to have to get out of here. I just want to remind you that I am here week after week to tell you about Jesus. That's why we're here. And I trust that you have uh, discovered Christ, that you've been born again, filled with the Spirit of God, and that you're living after, chasing after Jesus moment by moment, day by day. That's my prayer for you. Beloved, you have a great week. Remember, Jesus is coming back. Question is, is he coming back? <laughs>